All right, this is CS50, and this is now the start of week three. So, up until now, we've been writing programs in C that look a little something like this here. So we've got a couple of sharp includes at the top. We've got int, main, void, and then some to do in the middle, some bit of code inside of that function. But key has been the fact that we've been saying void here. So void, all of this time, specifies that this program, when run, can only be run via its name. You cannot type any other words or numbers after the program's name when running it. So, for instance, if the program were compiled into a file called hello, well, you could do dot slash hello, but that is it. The only way that you could provide input to this program is by calling a function. For instance, what function have we been using thus far to get input from the user? To get string or get int, or you've seen others, even if you haven't used them yet, like get long, long, and the like. But suppose that we actually wanted to start writing programs that are a little more versatile and, frankly, a little more like the commands that you've been getting, hopefully, a little bit accustomed to, like cd space Dropbox. This, of course, changes your directory, assuming you're in John Harvard's home directory, to your Dropbox folder. Meanwhile, a command like this creates a new directory called pset2, as you might have already or will soon for problem set2. Make hello, of course, is a command that builds a program called hello from a file called hello.c. And in each of these cases now, we've had to provide an argument on the so-called command line, the blinking prompt, so that make knows what to build, and so that make dir knows what folder to create, and so that cd knows where you want to go. But up until now, we keep saying that main, your default function, is, has a void expression inside of those parentheses, which means that it cannot take any arguments. So starting today, what we're going to do is going to start supporting things like this even. In fact, in this case, which you don't typically manually type, Make has been doing this for us, there are not one, but one, two, three additional strings after the program's name clang. So how do we achieve this? Well, starting today, in cases where we want to provide input via the so-called command line, we're going to start adding here what's in yellow, replacing void with int argc, comma, string argv, open bracket, close bracket. Now, this is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, it's going to let us write a little, uh, programs that are a little more dynamic. But more compellingly, it's going to open up now a conversation as to what arrays can really be used for, what a string really is underneath the hood, until next week when we start diving in even deeper as to how the machine is making all of this stuff work. But for now, let's draw perhaps a picture. When you write a program with main declared in this way, such that main takes two arguments, an int and what data type is the second argument? Array. So it looks at first glance like it's a string, but notice the square brackets. Recall last time we introduced the notion of an array, and arrays use square brackets in a couple of uh, contexts. You might use the square brackets to go into an array and get a particular element, like bracket 0 or bracket 1 or bracket 2. But we saw, if briefly last week, that you also use these square brackets to declare the size of an array, if you know in advance how many ints or how many strings or whatever you actually want. So it turns out there's a third context here that has no number inside of the square brackets. When you specify, as I have here, the name of something, like argv, which is just a fancy way of saying argument vector, which is another fancy way of saying an array of arguments, open bracket, close bracket just means that you don't necessarily know in advance how big the array is going to be, but you know it's going to be an array. So if you don't know the number, don't put it in there for open bracket, close bracket means that argv is not a string, but an array of strings. And so syntactically, if you think back last week, it's very similar to saying something like int ages open bracket and then something thereafter. So what does this look like? Let's actually draw a picture. So when you run this program with main having two, command, uh, two arguments defined inside of those parentheses, you essentially have at least two chunks of memory handed to you underneath the hood. One, as I'll draw as this rectangle, is going to be called argc. And just as a quick recap, what is the data type of argc? So it's an int. So a number is going to go in argc. Turns out that stands for argument count. And meanwhile, I've drawn, I've drawn argv as an array. And I don't really know how long it's going to be. So for today's purposes, dot, dot, dot. It might be of some length. But I've pictured here at least four rectangles. So argv is a chunk of memory that stores string, 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 dot, dot, dot. And argc is just one chunk of memory for an integer. So now let's be a little more precise. If when I have strings in this array called argv, 
I want to get at them individually. Just like last week, we're going to use notation like argv bracket 0 to get at the first thing in this array, argv bracket 1 to get at the second thing, and so forth. The key here being we're still 0 indexed. We're still counting from 0. So now let's actually put something in this. If I were to compile a program called hello from a file called hello.c, that give, and then I run that program with dot slash hello, what does my computer, my laptop, look like underneath the hood the moment I run dot slash hello and hit enter? Well, this is perhaps what we could describe as the contents of your computer's memory, or RAM, random access memory. In other words, the computer somehow for you magically puts the number 1 in argc, aka arg count, and it puts literally the string dot slash hello in argv bracket 0. I have no idea, frankly, what's in argv bracket 1 or 2 or 3, because if the user has not typed anything besides Dot slash hello, we're going to assume that these are most likely garbage values, so to speak. They might, those chunks of memory exist, but it's not up to us to look at them because the R count is only one. Now, meanwhile, if I write, run another program, cd, which is more properly a command in your blinking prompt, cd space Dropbox, when I run that, effectively, when the cd program is run, argc inside of my computer's memory is for the most briefest second the number two. And then argv bracket 0 has cd, argv bracket 1 has Dropbox, and then of course the command completes, so all of this memory essentially goes away and is used for something else. And that's why I say just a split second. Meanwhile, if we do make dir pset2, picture looks almost the same, but with different strings inside argv. If I do clang o hello hello.c, same idea, more stuff is filled in for argv, and argc of course is 4. So, in other words, even though this array might be dot, dot, dot of some variable length, so to speak, you always know where the end of it is because argc is going to tell you at what point you have to stop looking at elements in argv. You can only look at four in total in this case. So, let's now take a look at perhaps a simple program, one that just says hello to someone like Zamila. So, I claim I'm going to write a program in just a moment that via which I can do dot slash hello space Zamila. And then I want my program to print out something super simple like hello Zamila. Now, in the past, we've used get string. So, in the past, even if you're new to programming, odds are you could、uh, whip up a program that uses get string. And then uses printf to say hi to Zamila. But let's not use get string this time. Let me instead go into the appliance and do include standardio.h. Let me also include cs50.h. Now int main. And now I'm not going to do void today. Instead, I'm going to do int argc、uh, string argv open bracket close bracket, not specifying a number. And now here is my so called to do. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a bit of a leap of faith. I'm going to assume that the user is going to use this program correctly. And I'm simply going to do printf hello, comma, percent s, backslash n. So nothing new there. But I want to now put whatever word the user types after the program's name. So if I do dot slash hello, space Zamila, I want to somehow programmatically access quote unquote Zamila. So I can go into my argument vector, my array of strings. And if the command again was dot slash hello space Zamila, what number do I want to put in argv here? One, because bracket zero turns out is going to be the program's name as we saw. So bracket one is the first other word that I, the user, have typed. I'm going to go ahead and save this. I'm going to go into my folder where I've placed this file and I'm going to do make hello three, compiles OK, dot slash hello Zamila, enter. What did I do wrong? I was caught, off, caught by surprise myself for just a moment there. What did I do wrong? The file is actually called hello 3.c. And I did that just for consistency because we've had hello.c's in the past in the online code. So let's fix this. dot slash hello bracket、uh, dash 3, Zamila, enter. And now we have hello Zamila. Meanwhile, I can change this to be Rob or really any other word. But let's consider a corner case. What might you expect will happen if I don't type anyone's name at all? An error of some sort, perhaps. So let's see. Enter. Null. So printf is actually being a little protective of us here and literally printing open paren null. But even worse things can happen. And just to demonstrate something you absolutely shouldn't do, let's go in here and start poking around.、Right? If I know that the picture in memory is essentially this, argv bracket 1 has Zamila, argv bracket 0 has dot slash hello, or dot slash hello dash 3, what is in bracket 2? So, I can answer that question myself, right? I can just change the 1 to a 
I can now recompile hello3 dot slash hello3. Let's zoom in and hit enter. Whoops. No quote mark. Interesting. So that's kind of cool. Let's see what else is in here. So, what else is inside of my laptop? Let's save it with bracket three.、Uh, make hello3 dot slash hello3. Curious. And now let's get really bold 50. So, that's really diving deep into my computer's memory. 50 indexes in. So, make hello3 dot slash hello3. Curious. All right, now I'm just going to get reckless. Let's go to 5,000. All right, so let me recompile. Make hello3 dot slash hello3. Whew. Okay. Now, some of you, there might be a light bulb going off. How many of you have seen this message before? Okay. <laughs> So, why? Odds are, and there's different things that can cause this, and clearly you're in good company. We have clearly caused what's called a segmentation fault. And long story short, for today, I have touched a segment of memory that I shouldn't have, where a segment just means a chunk of memory that I shouldn't have. Now, the computer guarantees that if I run dot slash hello Zamila, that I can touch argv bracket zero and argv bracket one. But because argc is value two, That means I am only allowed, it's sort of the honor system, to touch bracket 0 and bracket 1. If I go any farther, there's absolutely going to be memory there. My RAM exists physically in the computer, but who knows what's there? Indeed, I'm running multiple programs at a time. I might have seen, if I weren't doing this on the appliance, but on my Mac or PC, I might have seen the contents of an email. I might have seen an instant message I recently sent. Anything that might be lingering around in memory could have been accessed by way of this arbitrary square bracket notation, or worse yet, You might have found one of my passwords that I had recently typed in, that a program had stored in memory so as to authenticate me, and then just kind of left it in RAM until I quit that program. And indeed, this is one of the dangers and one of the powers of using a language like C. You have unfettered access to the entire contents of a program's memory. And what bad guys can even do in those cases, especially when we get to web、uh, programming toward the end of the semester, we'll revisit this topic, is poke around potentially someone's computer's memory and find such. Uh, curious things as we saw there, or even worse yet, passwords that he or she can then use to do bad things. So clearly, I shouldn't have done this because weird things start to happen. Indeed, this is a program crashing. This would be the equivalent of Mac OS or in Windows, a program just window just disappearing. An unexpected error has occurred. In the command line environment, we see something like this. But that's why, is I'm simply touching memory that doesn't belong to me. So let's defend against this a little bit in a different way by looking at this program here. So, again, the skeleton that we saw earlier, and I've highlighted this time int, and all this time, main has indeed returned a value. Even though in most of our lecture examples, we've never once used return anything in main, we just write printf, close curly brace, and that's it. But for free, what the compiler's been doing for you effectively is returning zero for you. Turns out, and this is a little counterintuitive, that zero is good. It doesn't mean false per se, zero is good. And any non zero value the world has decided can signify an error. So if you've ever messed something up on your computer or a program has just died on you and you've gotten some ero、uh, erroneous window on your screen saying error negative 49 or error 23. Some seemingly arbitrary value, that's because a programmer has hard coded a value like negative 49 or positive 23 to represent any number, dare say, of 4 billion possible things that might go wrong in a program. So, how might I take advantage of this myself? Well, let me open up a program that I wrote in advance, you can poke around online, called Hello4, and it's almost identical, except it has got a little bit of error checking. In this case, I've again declared main as taking two arguments. But this time on line 17, notice I'm doing a bit of a sanity check. I'm making sure that argc equals equals 2. Because if it is, that means I can safely touch not only bracket 0, but bracket 1. And I go ahead and print out, in this case, Zamila or Rob or whatever word I've typed out. And now, just to get a little more proper, I'm going to explicitly return 0 to signify all is well, nothing bad happened. But by convention, I'm going to return 1. Or, frankly, any non zero value if something went wrong. Now, the user is not going to really notice what's going on. Indeed, if I go into this directory, let me zoom in and do make hello4 dot slash hello4 Zamila behaves as I expect. But if I instead don't type anything, 
nothing seems to happen, but it doesn't crash. And if I instead do something like、uh, Rob is a proctor in Thayer, sharing arbitrary information, but notice argv 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 should now exist in memory. That too is not what my program expects because I've checked whether argc equals equals 2 or not. So I'm now defending against this. Now, as an aside, we the programmer, or rather we the users, never see that 0 or 1, but using a tool called debugger or other tools, as we'll see before long, you the programmer can actually see what might be going wrong inside of your program. So, any questions on argc or argv? Yeah. They are. So the question is you have occasionally seen、uh, programs like this that don't say string argv bracket, but instead say something like char star argv bracket. And there's even other variants that you might see. They are indeed equivalent. For now, we have these so called training wheels on in the form of string in the CS50 library. But in just over a week or so, we're going to remove that abstraction altogether and actually look at what the char and the star are and how those pertain to memory representation more generally. So we'll come back to that. Other questions on argv or argc? Yeah. Why does it return an error only? Oh, in the previous case, when we were futzing around with memory, why did it only return an error when I really typed a big number? Short answer is we just got lucky. Generally speaking, a computer allocates memory in chunks, and it gave me a big enough chunk that I got away without being noticed of touching bracket 2, bracket 3, bracket 50. But as soon as I pushed my luck, I went beyond the boundaries of the chunk of memory the operating system had given me, and that's when it clamped down and said, no, segmentation error. Yeah. How does the computer know the value of argc?、Um, when you run a program,、uh, that program, by nature of the blinking prompt, is handed the array of words that were typed at the prompt, that was typed at the prompt. And so it is your operating system that essentially populates main's arguments for you. So that's one of the services that you get sort of secretly underneath the hood of an operating system. Other questions? Yeah. What does core dump mean? So that's a good question. And let me go back into this directory here. And you'll notice that I have a new file there. It's indeed called core. And it's actually typically a decent sized file. That is essentially a snapshot of the contents of my program's memory or RAM when it crashed. And this will be useful potentially diagnostically once we talk in a future lecture、um, and section about debugging, because you can actually do the equivalent of a digital autopsy on that file to help figure out what you did wrong in your program. Yeah. Good question. Is argc a command in, its, in itself, or can you name it anything?、Uh, it's definitely not a command. It's simply a variable's name or a, an argument's name. And so, absolutely, we could call this foo, we could call this var, which tend to be the go to words that a computer scientist goes to.、Um, but by convention, we use argc and argv. But that's just a human convention, nothing more. All right, so it turns out I've been telling a bit of a white lie, and frankly, in the future, you'll see we've been telling other white lies. But for now, we're going to peel back one of these. In this case here, when I previously ran a program like dot slash hello or dot slash hello dash three, Zamila, we had the contents of my computer's memory looking roughly like this. But recall what a string is. What did we say a week ago that a string actually is underneath the hood? It's an array of chars, right? So we might have an array of strings, but in turn, a string is an array of characters. So if I really want to be anal when I draw this picture, I should really be drawing it a little more like this, whereby in each of these indexes of my argv array, there is itself a whole string that itself is in an array. And now the white lie we're telling today is that the picture doesn't look quite like this. In fact, The little squares are typically outside of the big rectangles there, but we'll come back to that before long. But this is dot slash hello backslash zero, that being the special character that demarcates the end of a string, and we've got another one after Zamila's name. So, what does this mean? Well, let me go ahead and open up two other examples that are available online. One is called argv1 dash dot,、uh, dot c, and the other is argv2. It's a super simple program. That is different from past programs in that now I'm using argc and argv up here. And now I'm iterating with a for loop in line 18 from i equals 0 on up to argc. 
And what am I going to do with this line of code here? In English, this obviously demonstrates use of argc, but in English, what does it do if I run this program? Yeah. Exactly. So, whatever words I type at the prompt, it's going to regurgitate them at me one per line. So, let's go ahead and do this. Let me go into my directory and do make argv1.slash argv1. And now let's keep it simple. Let's do nothing at first. It did print out one thing, and that's indeed the name of the program, because that's in bracket zero. If I now say foo, it's going to do those two. And if I say foo bar, it's going to say those. Three things. Now that's somewhat interesting, maybe, but recall that argv is an array of strings, but a string is an array of chars, so we can take things up a notch and apply that basic logic and make code that looks a little more cryptic, admittedly, but by having a nested loop, something akin to what you might recall from Mario, for instance, if you took, did it this way. So now notice on line 19, I'm again iterating over my arguments from 0 on up to argc. And now in line 21, I'm borrowing a trick from last week. I am checking what is the length of argv bracket i. I'm storing that answer in n. And then I'm iterating from j on up to n, where j is initialized to 0. So, convention for counting. Once you've used i, if you have a nested loop, you can't use i again. Otherwise, you'll clobber potentially the value outside of the inner loop. So, I'm using j by convention. We might use k. And if you have more than k, you probably have too much nesting, typically. But now notice my printf line is slightly different. I'm not printing percent %s, I'm printing percent %c, which of course is a placeholder for a char. And now notice this syntax. New, we haven't seen it before, but logically, this just means get the ith string in argv and get the jth what? Character in that string. So by using square brackets followed by square brackets, this is diving first into argv's strings. And then the second square brackets with j is diving into the characters. Of that particular string in argv. And then just for good measure, I'm printing a new line here. So now let me go ahead and open up a slightly bigger window so we can see this in action. Let me go into that folder and now do make argv4, whoops, make argv2, dot slash argv2, enter. And it's a little hard to read vertically, but that's indeed the name of the program, followed by a blank line. Now let me go ahead and do foo. Similarly hard to read, but it's indeed printing one character per line. And if I do bar, it's now printing those line by line. So the takeaway here isn't so much that, wow, look at this neat new trick where you can get at the contents of an array's、uh, specific characters, but rather how we're taking these basic ideas, like indexing into an array and then indexing into an array that was in that array, and just applying these same ideas to slightly more sophisticated examples. But the basics really haven't changed even since last week. Now, this is sort of timely in that, recall in week zero, we played with a phone book like this. And even though this is obviously physical pieces of paper, you can kind of think of a phone book as an array. Certainly, if you were to re implement this piece of, these pieces of paper in a computer, probably you would use something like an array to store all of those names and numbers from A all the way through Z. So, this is nice because it allows us an opportunity, perhaps, to consider how you might actually implement something like that. As with a series of doors here. So, if I could,、um, we need one volunteer to come on up. Let's see, an unfamiliar face, perhaps, unfamiliar face, perhaps. How about in orange here? Orange shirt, come on up. Let's go ahead now and move these doors over to the side. Let's move these out of the way for a moment. All right, what's your name? Aj? a j David, nice to meet you. All right, so we have behind these six doors digitally on the screen,、uh, or rather seven doors on the screen, a whole bunch of numbers. And I have told you nothing in advance. Agreed? All I want you to do now is to find for me, and for us really, the number 50, one step at a time. The number 50. And you can reveal what's behind each of these doors simply by touching it with a finger. Damn it. <laughs> very, very well done. OK,、um, we have a lovely gift prize for you here.、Uh, your pick of movies we discussed last week. Oh, man. Oh, I've never seen them in Spaceballs. Spaceballs, all right. So hold on just one moment. 
how, let's, let's make this a teachable moment. Uh, how did you go about finding the number 50? Uh, I chose randomly. So you chose randomly and got lucky? Yes. OK, excellent. So now, had you not gotten lucky, what else might have happened behind these doors? So if I go ahead and reveal these numbers here, they actually are in random order. And the best you could have done, frankly, is by ultimately, in the worst case, checking them all. So you got super lucky. Um, <laughs> Which isn't what we'd call an algorithm. Yes, congrats. <laughs> but now let's uh, humor me, if you could. Let's go to this tab here. And here are the numbers in clearly in what seems to be a random order, and they were. But now if I instead claim that behind these doors are numbers that are sorted, the goal now is to also find us the number 50, but do it algorithmically and tell us how you're going about it. Okay. And if you find it, you keep the movie. If you don't find it, you give it back. Oh, man. I'm going to check the ends first to determine uh, if there's. Oh. <laughs> okay. Let's let's take a look at one of Jay's predecessors, Sean who wasn't quite as lucky. <laughs> OK, so your task here, Sean, is the following. I have hidden behind these doors uh, the number 7. But tucked away in some of these doors as well are other non-negative numbers. And your goal is to think of this top row of numbers as just an array. We're just a sequence of pieces of paper with numbers behind them. And your goal is only using the top array here, find me the number 7. And we are then going to critique how you go about doing it. Find us the number seven, please. <laughs> no. <laughs> Five, nineteen, thirteen. <laughs> it's not a trick question. <laughs> One. <laughs> At this point, your score is not very good, so you might as well keep going. Three. <laughs> Go on. Frankly, I can't help but wonder what you're even thinking about. <laughs> so <laughs> Only the top row. So you got three left. So find me seven. Seventeen. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> so both of those were amazing for very different reasons. So this is where we left off a moment ago. And the key insight here was that these doors had numbers behind them that were sorted. The ideal takeaway for which is that you could do fundamentally better in this second example. And indeed, that was Sean's first attempt with random numbers, just as before. But as soon as these numbers are sorted, much like the phone book, what can you obviously do, or how can you leverage that knowledge? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So AJ's um, initial instinct was to check the ends, as I recall, and then we sort of uh, finished the example quickly. But if we started to do this more methodically along those lines, but starting perhaps in the middle, because they're sorted, as soon as we reveal the number 16, we therefore know, and let's do exactly that, we therefore know that 50, in today's case, has got to be to the right. So just like in week zero when we tore the phone book in half and threw half of the problem away, same idea here, we can throw this half of the problem away. And probably what you might do algorithmically, once you know that 50 must be to the right if it's anywhere, is try there in the middle of the remaining doors. Of course, 50 is higher than 42, so we can throw this remaining quarter of the problem away and finally identify something like 50. But just as with the phone book, these numbers were given to us already in sorted order, which leaves us with the question, how do you get things into sorted order? And frankly, at what cost? 
It's one thing to be handed the phone book and then impress your friends by finding a phone number really quickly, right? Tearing 32 pages out to find a person out of 4 billion pages, we said was one extreme example. But how much time did it take Verizon to sort that phone book? How much time did it take us to sort these seven numbers? That's a question that we've thus far completely ignored. So let's answer this question now. And we, we're, we're all out of movies now, but we do have some stress balls. If, say, eight volunteers wouldn't mind joining us up here, let's go ahead and do how about the four of you,、uh, three of you here? Let's get some new faces and、uh, four of you there. And now let's not bias here. And number eight over here on the end. Yes, come on up. All right, so what we have here for each of you is a number. If you'd like to go ahead, take this number. What's your name? Arti. Arti? Arti? Okay, you're number one.、Uh, Amin. Amin, David, you're number two. And go ahead, as I hand you the sheets of paper, line yourselves up in front of the music stands in the same order as up there. Hi, Andy. Andy, nice to see you. Number three. Jacob. Jacob, number four. Welcome aboard. Grant. Grant, number five. Grant. Alana. Alana, number six. Francis. Francis, number seven. And? Rachel, number eight. All right, go ahead and get yourself in this order. Let me put one remaining music stand in place. Where do you need a stand? Okay, and go ahead and just put your numbers where the,、uh, your, uh, the audience can see them on the music stand facing outward. And hopefully, our first sanity check here four, two, <laughs> six. <laughs> oh, oh, wait a minute. We don't have an eight. I need to evict you from the example somehow. <laughs> Um, no, that's okay. Let's see. We can do this. Stand by. There we go. Correct. All right. So now we have eight, one, three, seven, five. Okay, excellent. So the question at hand is at what cost and via what method can we actually sort these numbers here so that we can kind of work backwards ultimately and decide is it really impressive? Is it really efficient that I can divide and conquer a phone book? Is it really efficient that I can divide and conquer those digital pieces of paper on the board if maybe it's going to cost us a fortune in time or energy or CPU cycles to actually get our data into some sorted order? So let's ask that question. So, first, these numbers are in pretty much random order, and I'm going to propose one algorithm or process by which we can sort these folks. I'm going to approach this pretty naively, and I'm going to recognize that it's kind of a lot for me to wrap my mind around the whole data set at once, but you know what? I'm going to make some very simple marginal fixes. Four and two are out of order if the goal is to go from one on up to eight. So, you know what? I'm going to have you guys swap if you'd switch physically positions and your pieces of paper. Now, four and six, these are in order. I'm going to leave those be. Six and eight, those are in order. I'm going to leave them be. Eight and one, out of order. If you two wouldn't mind swapping. Now, eight and three, if you guys could swap. Eight and seven, if you guys could swap. And eight and five, if you guys can swap. Now, I'm, am I done? No, obviously not. But I have made the situation better, right? What was your name again? Number eight? Rachel. So Rachel has effectively bubbled up pretty far all the way to the end of my array of numbers here. And so that problem is kind of solved. Now, clearly, two still needs to move a bit, and four, and six, and one. But I seem to have gotten a little closer to the solution. So let's apply the same naive heuristic again. Two and four, OK. Four and six, OK. Six and one, mm mm. Let's swap. Six and three, mm mm. Let's swap. Six and seven is OK. Seven and five, nope. Let's swap. And now seven and eight. And what's your name again? Francis. Francis. So now Francis is in even a better position because now seven and eight are correctly bubbled up to the top. So two and four, okay. Four and one, let's swap. Four and three, let's swap. Four and six, you're okay. Six and five, let's swap. And now those guys are good. We're almost there. Two and one out of order, so swap. And now let me do a sanity check. Two and three, three and four, four and five, five and six, six and seven, eight. Okay. So we're done. But at what cost did I sort? These numbers here. Well, how many steps did I potentially take when sorting these folks? Well, we'll come back to that question, but frankly, if you got a little bored, that's kind of revealing in that this wasn't maybe the most efficient algorithm. And indeed, frankly, I'm sweating all the more walking back and forth. It didn't feel particularly efficient. So let's try something else. If you guys could reset yourselves to these eight values. <laughs> Good job. Let's take a look digitally for just a moment before we try something else at what just happened. 
Up here, you're about to see a visualization of these eight humans, whereby blue and red bars represent numbers. The taller the bar, the bigger the number. The shorter the bar, the smaller the number. And what you're going to see is, in random order, more than eight of them, you're going to see these bars getting sorted by that same algorithm or set of instructions, which we'll call henceforth bubble sort. So notice. Every second or so, two bars are lighting up in red. They're being compared by the computer. And then, if the big bar and the little bar are out of order, they are being swapped for me. Now, this is incredibly tedious to watch this, certainly for very long. But notice the takeaway big bars moving to the right, little bars moving to the left. Let's abort this process and speed this up to be much faster so we can get a high level sense of what indeed bubble sort is doing. Indeed, it's bubbling up to the right hand side of the list or the array, the bigger bars, and conversely, the little bars are bubbling their way down to the left, albeit at a faster pace than we previously did. So, harder to see with humans, but visually, that's indeed what was happening. But let's try a fundamentally different approach now. Let's try a different algorithm whereby we have you guys start in these original positions, which was this order here. And let's go ahead now, and I'm going to do something even simpler, right? In retrospect, swapping pairwise again and again, almost a little clever. Let's do things even more naively, where if I want to sort these folks, let me just keep looking for the smallest element. So right now, four is the smallest number I've seen. I'm going to remember that. No,、nope. two is better. I'm going to remember that. Six, eight, one, one is even smaller. Three, seven, five. OK, and one, what's your name again? Artie. Artie. So, Artie, go ahead. I'm going to pull you out of the line if you can come back here. And I, I need to make room for him. We have a decision point here. How might we make room for Artie here at the beginning where number one belongs? OK, a y we could shift everyone, but propose an optimization. That feels a little annoying for me to ask four people to move all the way down. What else could I do? Switch them. And what's your name again? Jacob. Jacob. Jacob, move. Much more efficient just to have Jacob swap locations with Artie as opposed to forcing all four of these folks, thank you very much, to in their correct position. What's nice about Artie now, he's in his correct position. Let's do this again. Two, that's the smallest number I've seen. Six, eight, four, three, seven, five. OK, a y two is definitely the smallest. Don't have to do any work. Let's do it again. Six, smallest, eight, no, four. Ooh, let me remember four. Three, ooh, let me remember three, seven, five. Smallest number I've seen on this pass is three. If you'd com、uh, come on out. Where are we going to put you? And what's your name? Alana. Alana, we're going to have to evict you. But that is more efficient to just swap two people than to have multiple people actually sidestep over. Now, let's do this again. I'm going to select the four, so come on out. And who's going to move? Number eight, of course. If I now find number five, come on out. Number eight's going to get evicted again. I'm now going to find number six in place, seven in place, eight in place. What we just did now is something called selection sort. And if we visualize this, it's going to feel a little different. Let's go ahead and from this menu here in this visualization, let's change this to, come on, Firefox. Let's change this to selection sort. And let's speed it up as before and start the visualization now. And this algorithm has a different feel to it. On each iteration, frankly, even more straightforwardly, I'm just selecting the smallest element. Now, frankly, I got a little lucky that time in that it sorted super fast. The elements were random. It's not, as we'll eventually see, fundamentally faster, but let's see a third and final approach here as to what's going on. So let's go ahead and reset you guys one final time to be in this order here. And now I'm going to be a little more clever just to round out our algorithms. I'm going to do this. I'm going to not go back and forth so much. Frankly, I'm tired of all this traversing. I'm just going to take what I'm given at the beginning of the list and I'm going to sort that then and there. So here we are, number four. I'm going to insert number four into a sorted list. Done. I claim now, and just to make this more clear, this part of my list is sorted. It's kind of a stupid claim, but it, indeed, four is sorted in a list of size one. Now I'm going to take on number two. Number two, I'm now going to insert into the right place. So where does two belong? Obviously, over here. So go ahead and move back if you could. And why don't you guys just take your、uh, music stands with you this time? And let's forcibly insert you into the beginning of the list. So a little more work. I had to move Jacob、uh, around.、Um, with, and what's your name? I mean. I mean. 
but at least I didn't go back and forth. I'm just taking things as I go. I'm just inserting them in the right place. Six, this is actually pretty easy. Let's insert you over there if you want to just move over slightly. Number eight, also pretty easy, right over there. Damn it. Number one, we can't just swap with a mean here, right? Because that's going to mess up the order. So we have to be a little more clever. So if Artie, you could back up for a moment. Let's go ahead and shift now, unlike our previous algorithms, to make room for Artie right here at the beginning. So at the end of the day, I'm kind of doing what I wanted to avoid before. And so my algorithm is sort of reversed intellectually from what it originally was. I'm just doing the shifting at a different point. Now I'm at three.、Oh, damn, we have to do more work again. So let's push you out. Let's move eight, six, four. Oh, oh. And three is going to go right there. So at least slight savings this time. Seven, not too much work to be done. So if you want to pop back, let's insert you. And lastly, five, if you want to pop back, we need to shift you, you, you. Until five is in place. So now to see this at a high level graphically, let's do this algorithm visualization one additional time. So this we shall call insertion sort. We'll run it just as fast and start it here. And it too has a different feel. It's sort of getting better and better, but it's never perfect until I go in and smooth in those gaps. Because again, I'm only taking what I'm being given from left to right. So I didn't get so lucky that everything was perfect. That's why we had these little mispositions that we fixed over time. So all of these algorithms seem to run at slightly different paces. In fact, which would you say is the best or the fastest so far? Bubble sort, the first. Selection sort, the second. Insertion sort, the third. I hear some selection sorts. Other thoughts? So it turns out that all of these algorithms are fundamentally just as efficient as each other, or conversely, just as inefficient as each other, because we can do fundamentally better than all three of these algorithms. And that's a bit of a white lie, too. When I say as efficient or as inefficient, that's at least for super large values of n. When we have just eight people here, or maybe 50 or so bars on the screen, you'll absolutely notice differences among these three algorithms. But is n, the number of people, or the number of numbers, or the number of people in the phone book, or the number of web pages in Google's database gets bigger and bigger, we'll see that all three of these algorithms are actually pretty. Pretty poor, and we can do fundamentally better than that. Let's take a look finally at what these algorithms might sound like in the context of a few others as well, by way of this visualization here that will introduce us to a number of algorithms. Let's go ahead and、uh, congratulate our participants here, all of whom supported themselves very well. If you'd like to take a, a parting gift, you can keep your numbers as well. And what you'll see, or rather hear now, is that as we put sounds to each of these bars and associate with the software a different frequency of sound, you can wrap your mind more audibly, audibly around what each of these things look like. The first of which is insertion sort. <laughs> This is bubble sort. Selection sort. Something called merge sort. Gnome sort. That's it for CS50. We will see you on Wednesday. And now, deep thoughts by Davin Farnham. Why is it a for loop? 
Why not make it better? I'd make a five loop. <laughs>